Welcome to PFT Tutor with Jeffrey Haynes. Please click the like, subscribe, and notification buttons. It's greatly appreciated. To subscribe, click or tap on the YouTube icon in the right lower corner of the screen. In this video, we're going to discuss a common error encountered during spirometry testing, submaximal inhalation error, when the forced inspiratory vital capacity is larger than the forced expiratory vital capacity. We'll discuss how to identify it and ways to correct it. If you're experienced performing spirometry, I'm sure you've seen a flow volume loop like this before. Let's take a closer look at this pattern. The blue arrows show the direction of expiratory flow as a function of volume. The expiratory flow should terminate at or close to residual volume. Once end of forced exhalation criteria have been achieved, the patient is instructed to take a full quick inhalation back up to total lung capacity as depicted by the red arrow. As you can see, the inspiratory loop exceeds the point where forced expiratory flow began, indicating that the patient hadn't inhaled fully prior to forced exhalation, and this is the nature of the submaximal inhalation error. If you're using spirometry software based on the 2005 ATS ERS standards, you may see this pattern without an error message from the software because it wasn't designated as an error until the 2019 standards were published. In 2015, Dr. Kaminsky and myself wrote this letter on respiratory care, supporting the idea that submaximal inhalation should be flagged as an error during spirometry testing. In our letter, we included this example of the impact of submaximal inhalation on spirometry results. In panel A on the left, there is submaximal inhalation error. The end of the inspiratory loop exceeds the start of the expiratory flow as identified by the red arrow. In panel B, on the right, the error has been corrected. Let's look at the data that was generated from these different flow volume loops. In terms of the FEV1 to FVC ratio, there was no difference. When there was a submaximal inhalation error, the ratio was 53%, and when it was corrected, it was basically the same at 54%. However, this error had a significant impact on the force vital capacity. When there was a submaximal inhalation error, the recorded force vital capacity was 3.05, with a z-score of minus 1.93. When the submaximal inhalation error was corrected, the force vital capacity went up to 3.26 liters, and this became a normal value with a z-score of minus 1.54. The FEV1 was also affected by the submaximal inhalation error. When the error was present, the recorded FEV1 was 1.61. It increased by 150 mLs when the error was corrected, but remained markedly abnormal with a z-score of minus 3.52. In the 2019 ATS ERS spirometry standards, submaximal inhalation error was added to the acceptability criteria. Specifically, for a test to achieve an acceptability score, the difference between the forced inspiratory vital capacity and the forced expiratory vital capacity must be equal to or less than 100 mLs, or 5% of the vital capacity, whichever is greater. If this is not achieved, the test may be deemed as usable, but not acceptable. In other words, if the force vital capacity is 2 liters or less, the 100 ml criteria apply. But for force vital capacities greater than 2 liters, the 5% rule applies. So as the force vital capacity gets larger, the acceptable gap between inspired and expired volumes also increases. For example, if the force vital capacity is 4 liters, a gap of up to 200 mLs is considered acceptable. Here's a real-life example. The force expiratory vital capacity is 4.47 liters, and the force inspiratory vital capacity is 4.64 liters, a difference of 170 mLs. But because 5% of the vital capacity is 220 mLs, the 170 mL gap is considered acceptable. So let's talk about why this is happening and what we can do to fix this problem. There are a number of reasons why you may encounter submaximal inhalation error during spirometry testing. They can be technical, they can be due to the performance of the technologist, and they can be due to the patient, either failing to inhale fully or possibly chest wall dynamics. A technical problem that can cause a false submaximal inhalation error is when you have a negative zero flow error. So when the spirometer is supposed to be reading zero flow and nobody is breathing on the spirometer, when you have a negative zero flow error, inspiratory flows are being measured. And when this happens, anything that's measured during the expiratory phase will be underestimated, but anything that's measured on the inspiratory phase will be amplified, 
given the appearance of a larger inspiratory flow loop. When a negative zero flow error is present, you'll notice that everything is trending downward. So if you see this pattern, have the patient come off the spirometer, re-zero the spirometer, and that should fix the problem. Another cause of submaximal inhalation error is you and I, the technologists. Sometimes submaximal inhalation error is caused by the technologist if we're giving the patient the command to begin forced exhalation before they've inhaled fully to total lung capacity. So always be careful that when you're conducting the test, you make sure that they're completely filled, you see inspiratory flow end before you give the command to blast the air out. I have found with some patients that they do better without me. So if we're not being great dance partners, I'll have them breathe normally and I'll tell them whenever you're ready, take the deepest breath in you can. As soon as you're full, blast it out and you'll sometimes get better results this way this can also reduce back extrapolated volume error as well. But of course, often the submaximal inhalation area is uh, the patient's fault uh, because they're just not taking a full breath in. So as the technologist, it's important to emphasize the importance of taking a full breath prior to forced exhalation. Taking a deep breath isn't good enough. It must be a full breath and encourage the patient to raise their shoulders, expand their chest out fully before they begin forced exhalation. There also seems to be some patients, independent of effort or cooperation, who just inhale to a higher lung volume when they start from expiratory reserve volume or from residual volume than they do when they start the deep inhalation from FRC. And I don't have any data, but I just wonder if this is them loading the chest wall with all kinds of energy, and then when they start inhalation, the ribs expand and they're getting a larger volume that way. Um, it does seem to be more common in obese patients, but once again, I don't have any data. It's just my observation. So now I'm going to review a couple of cases of patients I tested and show you how I deal with a submaximal inhalation error when just instruction and encouragement doesn't work. So this patient starts off breathing tidally. So exhale, inhale, exhale, take a full breath in, blow all the way out. They're empty, take a full breath back in. You can see that the inspired volume is greater than the initial inspiration. And over in the flow volume loop, you can see when they were empty and they took a deep breath back in, the inspiratory loop exceeded the expiratory loop. And when this spirometry maneuver was graded by the software, it failed acceptability because the gap between the inspired vital capacity and the expired vital capacity was in excess of 100 mLs or 5% of the vital capacity. And as I showed earlier, this earned a usability uh, grade, but not an acceptability grade. So since some of these patients just consistently inhale deeper from ERV or RV, what I do is I have them breathe tidally. I have them exhale first, like you do for a DLCO test, and then take the deep breath in prior to forced exhalation. And in this case, you can see that the patient was doing tidal breathing. I had them exhale first, down to residual volume. And then when I had them take the full breath in, they got a fuller breath in. They blew all the way out. And then when they did the subsequent inspiratory maneuver, it was matching the first one. And this is a very effective way to deal with sort of the recalcitrant submaximal inhalation error. The other thing you can try to correct a submaximal inhalation error is just have the patient do a second forced expiratory maneuver. So as you can see here, I have the patient doing tidal breathing. They take a full breath in, blow all the way out. The second time they take a full breath in, it exceeds the inspired volume from the first one. So I just have them do it again. Forcefully exhale again, and then when they're empty the second time, and you see they take an inspired volume, that they are much closer together and you can see the differences in the flow volume loops. And sometimes this can be really challenging to fix. Uh, there are patients where you just give them better instructions, making sure as a technologist you're not time to blow too soon, or you have them exhale to RV first, or you have them do a second forced exhalation as I showed on the previous slide. But as you can see here, I did three different uh, inspired maneuvers and each one of them went to a higher lung volume. So it can certainly be a challenge to try to correct this error in some patients. But it is important to correct this error because it can have a significant impact on the recorded spirometry values. 
in the uh, first test here, you see it got a grading of just usable um, because there was a submaximal inhalation error. And on the second attempt, when this error was corrected, the force vital capacity went up quite a bit from 3.19 liters to 3.4, and the FEV1 went up from 1.87 to 2.06. So something you definitely need to pay attention to um, to make sure you're reporting uh, accurate data. And the other thing that can happen is if you have this error in the pre-bronchodilator phase, and then you correct it in the post, the patient just gets better at doing it, it can give you a false bronchodilator response. And this can be uh, very challenging, as I said. So you can see in this uh, example, efforts uh, one through six all had a submaximal inhalation error, all getting uh, usability uh, gradings uh, because of this. Um, finally got it corrected on an, an effort number seven. You may appreciate that in this particular patient, it really affects the force vital capacity more than the FEV1. Another thing to keep in mind is that a submaximal inhalation error may be present even if it's not shown by an inspiratory loop exceeding the inception of expiratory flow. So in this example here, just imagine if the patient's inspiratory loop was also submaximal as shown in the red tracing, you would look at this and say, well, there's no um, sign that the inspiratory loop exceeded the expiratory loop, so there must be fine, but clearly there is a problem. You could also have a submaximal inhalation error with a perfectly shaped flow volume loop as shown here. In the red tracing, the inspired loop is, is not full, but it just so happens to connect with the expiratory loop, giving you the impression that the patient inhaled fully when they really didn't. The telltale pattern for a submaximal inhalation error when the flow volume loop looks normal is when data are symmetrically lower. So if you look at effort three as compared to one, two, four, and five, you can see that both the force vital capacity and the FEV1 are symmetrically lower than the others. And this effort was graded as acceptable by the software because there was no evidence that there was a difference between the inspiratory vital capacity and the expiratory vital capacity. And as far as the FVC goes, they reached a plateau, so they exhaled fully. You can also see that the peak flow for effort number three is adequate and similar to the others. So if they blew out fast enough and they blew out long enough, but all of the data are symmetrically lower, that usually means that they didn't inhale fully and that's a submaximal inhalation error. Key points, submaximal inhalation error is very common during spirometry testing. The force vital capacity and FEV1 can be markedly affected when this error is present. Sometimes it is the technologist's fault if we are giving the command to forcefully exhale prior to the patient reaching total lung capacity. It's important for us to emphasize the importance of inhaling fully, not just deep, a full deep breath in before starting the forced expiratory maneuver. As I mentioned earlier, some patients may do better performing spirometry without you. Um, instead of waiting for you to give the command to blast out, have them breathe normally when they're ready full breath in as soon as they're full, blast it out. Um, things you can do to try to correct the submaximal inhalation error, try having the patient exhale first into residual volume, just like you do it with DLCO prior to that first deep inhalation. Um, and you can always have the patient do a second forced expiratory maneuver if the inspired volume is obviously deeper than the first one. A submaximal inhalation error may be occurring without your knowledge. Um, so the inspiratory loop is helpful at identifying, but as I showed a few slides ago, this can still be present if the inspiratory loop is submaximal. Thank you for watching PFT Tutor with Jeffrey Haynes. Please click the like, subscribe, and notification buttons, and we'll see you next time.